Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas, and the mentor to the UConn men's most likely national champions. Big game tonight, Teddy. Yeah, huge game, huge game. I'm nervous, to be honest. <laughs> I was going to say, I know you're on pins and needles. Yeah, it's... Listen, they're just great guys, great coaches. If, if I only knew them that way and I hadn't gotten involved in talking to him throughout the year before the year started and everything else. And if my son didn't have a bet on him at 33 to 1, <laughs> you know, because he went to my bookie before the year started when he found out I talked to them and he put a small little something down on him. So it's right there on, on you kind of 33 to 1. But um, no, really the only thing, I'm just nervous because I know that I would – I would root for them if I didn't speak to them and I just knew the kind of people they were. They're, they're just excellent people. They're, they're just outstanding human beings. The coaches, the players. The coach I mean, is getting crazy love from everyone. He's getting well, recognition. He, he, I saw a clip of him saying early awesome. in the season, is like the, the people don't realize what's coming, but it's coming. We're, we're, yeah. we're on the precipice. It's coming. Well, and it's, it, it, it's there. <laughs> It's coming and it's it's arrived, and um, he can crash through tonight. I mean, he they just I I always say it, you know. Character means character means something. I mean, when you have that strength of character, that selflessness, that ability to care about others as much, if not more, than yourself. Um, when you have those quiet talents, not only the neon ones. But the quiet ones, like, you know, resiliency, determination, uh, you know, dependability, reliability, you know, just uh, just the ability to find a way to care about your commitment so much and your commitment to others, in this case, so much that you will go beyond the realm, beyond the pale, to find a way. We will go further for others as human beings. It's our nature. Then sometimes we will. It's just our nature. Because for ourselves, we can get to a point where we're satisfied. But when somebody else is depending on us, that point is farther away. And we will stretch ourselves out, journey ourselves out to get to that place. And that's part of why I felt so strongly about why they were going to win it all. And I could make such an outrageous statement, you know, in October. Who knew that I would be close to being right? But uh, because character counts, character matters. There is a strength that carries on to your playing field. Wherever that playing field may be, whether it's athletics or non-athletics, I don't care. Wherever that arena of work is, that that personal strength, carries on to there. And and it's at play here. It's at play here. So, you know, they're playing San Diego State, and they're overcoming things like anybody does, not just them. But, I mean, their best shooter, their best scorer, Hawkins. And, you know, I mean, it, it's him. It's him. Uh, and and also, also the, the center who – Who's just well? They got so many role players. I mean, it's just so no goal is unbelievable, but they got so many plays. But Hawkins is a pure shooter. He, he's he's probably the best shooter in college basketball, at least I think so. And a lot of other people I think would agree with me. And he had the flu. It happens. You can't control those things. And he was sick. And he went out there, and it was almost like the get into it. But it was almost like a Willis Reed. They touched on it, but a Willis Reed moment back in the day in the Knicks when the Knicks were playing the Lakers against the great Will Chamberlain in a seventh championship game. And Willis Reed had torn his thigh muscle, his knee or his thigh, but I believe his thigh really bad, really bad in the fifth game, after, after the fifth game. So the sixth game, they were up. You know, they were three games to two. The sixth game, they got – Will Chamberlain scored 44 points, and, and they won. 
and it went to the seventh game. And Wilt wasn't supposed to be available. I mean, um, Willis Reed was a great man. He came to my first charity dinner. Just a special man, special human being, special player. He wasn't supposed to be available. And selflessness. He wouldn't have played for himself, put it that way. And the team needed him. He was the captain. He They shoot him up. God knows what they shot him with. But they shoot him up in the locker room. And he limps out onto the court on warm-ups. Oh, my, Madison Square Garden went berserk. I was listening on the radio with Marv Albert. The great Marv Albert was calling it. And you could, it was, you could feel it. You could just feel the electricity. You could feel the emotion. You could, you, once he did that, you knew they were going to win. I know it sounds crazy, but you knew they were going to win. They couldn't lose. They, they couldn't let him down. He couldn't let them down. He comes out. He's limping. He hits his first two shots, Ken. Bang. First two shots. He doesn't score another point. He don't even play that much more. It doesn't matter. It was set. It was set in stone. The, the rest of the team just were carried by, by that emotional wave and that, that selflessness. I use the word again. We don't use it enough. We don't practice it enough in life. And they go on and they win. When Hawkins came out, what does he do? He's sick as a dog. He hits his first three-pointer. He hits a big three-pointer. Bang! The team was like, "We, that's it. Let's go. Let's go, baby. I mean, uh, you just knew no matter what. So anyway, they got they got guys doing what they got to do no matter how they feel, no matter what. One guy picking up for the other. They got a bunch of role players. <laughs> they got guys named Joey California. I mean, you got to root for a team that's got Joey California. Joey California is coming in. I mean, they got they just got a great group of players and human beings, and they got it going. Look, San Diego State's tough. They play good defense. They gritty. They're tough. They they had an incredible comeback against Florida Atlantic who was another Cinderella team. They they hit the winning shot and won by a point at the buzzer. Incredible. I mean, and they were getting third and fourth opportunities hitting those offensive boards. Both these teams hit the offensive boards. But San Diego State, good at hitting those boards, good at defense, you know, gritty. They got plenty of heart. It's, it's going to be an interact. UConn, let's go, baby! I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I, I just, I, I had to say it. And um, again, but it's going to be an interesting game. It's going to be a great game. You know what? First, we're going out to dinner for my daughter's birthday. My talk about greatness. I'm sorry for being silly right now and bragging a little bit. But my daughter, she's a lawyer. She's got two kids. She's got a third on the way. She takes care of the kids the way your mother should in the morning before she go, then gets on a bus to Manhattan, goes into Ma- comes back, puts them to bed, washes them. Her husband helps, obviously. But, I mean, I couldn't be more proud of her. She's in she's in New York now. She's doing a deposition. She goes, we're going to go to dinner at her favorite restaurants, Ponte Vecchio's in Brooklyn later on. Um, so we're going to do that. This is Monday, by the way, so... You're going to see this on Tuesday when our broadcast goes up. So hopefully uh, by then, you know, UConn is the champions. And, of course, my daughter will be uh, one day older. But um, we're going out with her. Like I said, she's she's something else. We went to – she was General Patton in uh, Disney. Without her, we'd still be looking around for a ride. We, we – I, I – I would still be looking around to see uh, how do we get past this four-hour line and all that stuff. She navigated us through everything. But as you're proud of your family and everybody out there listening to us, they're proud of their families. God bless everybody. I'm proud of my son. I'm proud of my daughter. Not just because of what they've done professionally and they're raising great kids and beautiful grandchildren for us, but just the people they are. The word again, I use it again. They're selfless. And, um, you know, their mother did a good job. <laughs> their, their mother did a good job, like your wife did a good job, although you, you're a big part of that. Um, anyway, let's go, baby. 
let's uh let's go let's you know one of the th- one of the things that um i thought about when you were talking about selflessness i was talking to a friend of mine this morning one of my best friends who i grew up with he's a scout for the devils and he was with he won two cups with the pittsburgh penguins and i said to him just in passing like man the bruins are unbelievable huh they're like coming up on the best record you think they're gonna win the cup and he's like you know why they're so good right and i said no i mean what do you mean and he told me these stats i wanted to share them with you because it's it it's a perfect segue from what you just described with yukon and selflessness do you know that the bruins have their two best players patrice two of their best players patrice bergeron and david krejci listen to this stat teddy david krejci has been making 7.5 7.5 million dollars a year from 19, from 2015 through 2021. This year, playing for a million dollars. Could have got 10 million elsewhere. Patrice Bergeron got paid 8.75 million since 2014 per season. 100 million in career earnings. And I know you'd say like, "Oh, well, you've made that much money. Why do you need more?" Sure. A lot of people would say that. Not many people would do it. I he's playing it. this he's playing this season for 1.5 million because as a result, the Bruins have been able to go out and sign third line players that are making six million dollars that would be starting on another team. But he was telling me that uh, this kid, my friend Al Santilli, he was saying not only are these guys taking less so they could go sign these, but now all these other guys who are veteran players are like, listen, these two guys have given up essentially nine, eight to ten million dollars each to win a cup. Every single Better person shows up. Better he said it. if they get a guy who doesn't block a shot. They, he's benched two games. Every person there wants to die to I'm win. So they traded. Piggyback what, I, piggyback what I said with this. This is this is what we're talking about. They traded for a guy, Garnett Hathaway. The guy shows up. His parents come to a game to watch. You know, at the end of the day, Teddy. You know, these guys are they're like little kids too. They, they're like anyone. Like holy shit, I'm playing for the Bruins. The kids' parents come. Patrice Bergeron comes out of the locker room after the game, goes over, introduce himself. Hey, glad to have Garnett on the team. Listen, if you guys need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. Signs a jersey for them. Like, this is stuff that veteran players, like, I don't want to pick on anyone, but you imagine some, like, big-name superstars going out and saying, hey, we just traded for some random guy. He's not a rookie. He's been there. But, you know, the parents are... They're still your children, right? So, like, they're enamored 100%. with the fact that the captain of the team. So, 100%. anyway, I just think that, you know, okay, obviously, There's I power. love the Bruins. I'm biased the Bruins towards the, the Bruins. They have but, that power. We already know they know how to skate. We already know they know how to shoot. We already know they got a competent guy in the goaltender. But two. That- they're two goalies are two of the top. The two goalies are in the top five in every category. Saves, wins. They alternate goalies. It's unheard of. But oh, yeah. the point is, not only are the guys happy to be on the team and those guys were selfless and took less money, but power. now people are playing for each other. Everyone I've spoken to that knows these guys and a lot of There's my friends in Boston are close with the players, they're like, these guys genuinely love and care about each other. So I said to him, I go, anything can happen in the playoffs. He goes, dude. The Bruins have lost 11 games out of out of almost 80 games. He goes, you think someone's going to beat them four out of seven games? He goes, lightning would have to strike. He's like, they've only lost two or three They're games at home. They're not going to let it happen because of exactly. the things you just went over. Yep. That's the bottom line. Character matters, people. But this is what people will do to win a title to put that like crowning moment on their career. And when I think about like Fury and Usyk, and again, I'm not trying to count anyone's money. But like Usyk said, 70-30, it could have been 90-10. I believe Usyk would fight him for free to unify the titles. I think he just wants to be the champ. And, you know, they all point in the finger. You want a rematch clause? You want to, I don't know. From an unbiased perspective, we like both guys looking from the outside, looking in. Usyk wants the fight, and I don't think Fury was in shape, and I don't think six weeks was enough. And I think Usyk told him, yeah, April 29th, you're done. And I don't think he expected it, as we've discussed. I said, as I said earlier on this podcast, uh, Mr. Fury has other options. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, it's just that, but he's got other options. He can fight yeah. the doorman in your building and and get, you know, at least 40,000 people in the stadium. You know? For at least 40,000. If he fights you, he'll get 50,000. You know? I mean, uh, that's just a fact. It's a fact for him. It's a fact for Canelo. I mean, there's certain people that are in that, you know, Privileged position, God bless them. They work for it, but they they can fight just about anybody and still make a 
a boatload of money. And you know what? That changes their options a little bit. That changes urgency in certain areas. You know, not having to do what other people might feel more of a pressure to do. You know, not what other people feel they have to do. That's part of it. But that's a good – I'm glad we had this conversation because it's just a healthy one. It's just a yeah. healthy one. You know, I said from the beginning when we started this thing, you asked me, what do you want to do with this podcast besides, you know, hopefully make the fights more entertaining for people and educate them in certain areas, hopefully, in boxing. And then later on, it turned out to be with, we were blessed with MMA, especially with the striking area, and, and to break those things down. But the thing for me was to – life's a fight, like I said. Yeah. That's why the name of this thing is to fight. And to connect the dots to everybody's fight, to connect the dots in life, in life. It's interesting, the feedback we get, because I think some people like the little the banter before we get into the fights and talking about life. And one guy in particular was talking about he liked the Disney parts. But then there'll be other people like, I don't give a crap about this. Get to the fights like you can't. You'll never you could so you what? could walk so on what? water and someone would tell you you can't swim. So we're never going to satisfy everyone. The bottom line is we're no, just two guys, me, a boxing me, analyst and a fan talking that. about boxing they and fighting. Tell, they would tell me that my socks were wet. But listen, <laughs> their socks are wet sometimes. Sometimes. Yep. We're right? never going to satisfy and, everyone. You know, it's, um, you know me, I have to go into a little bit of a, a, a movie nostalgia moment. And when you were just talking about, you know, basically team being a team. Being a team, yeah. not just the best athletes, but a team, caring about people, a team, you care about others, you know, being a teammate. I went into a crazy place because, but fans expect that from me now with the movies. And I went to the movie, The Untouchables with, <laughs> it's a little harsh. It's a little harsh. You might, you might want to turn your head a little bit um, with the De Niro when he's talking to his crew of guys and he says, Baseball, it's a team game. It's a team game. It's a great game. Team, you know, somebody's, everybody's got a job to do. Everybody looks out for the team. What happens when somebody decides, well, they don't want to play defense. They want to catch. They don't want to, they just want to hit. They don't want to run the bases. They don't want to do those other things to help the team. What is that? Not a team player. Selfish individualism, that's what he called it, which is basically another word in the movie at that point for being selfish. Individualism hurts the team, not a team player. And then he takes the baseball bat, he goes behind the guy. Crack! That was, <laughs> that, that was, <laughs> that was, the guy never got a chance to get back uh, to learn how to be a team player. He never got quite that <laughs> opportunity to redeem himself. We give people a chance to redeem themselves, to be team players. That's what we do. Rob, get that piece up there uh, if you can. <laughs> and one quick thing before we get into the fights, Teddy, speaking of movies, one time I was watching <laughs> I was watching a, a war movie. My my middle son likes likes war movies and army stuff and he's like dad there's a movie called 1917 i want to watch with you i don't think this is where my wife and i just thank god for my wife because she's like you can't watch that movie with a little kid i'm like why not it's a war a movie about war it's not like has it doesn't have any adult she's like uh. it's people shooting and killing each other so Ooh. needless to say we watched the movie and <laughs> he had nightmares Ooh. for a few days afterwards but as i was watching it you don't think about the ramifications it has on the children but it just made me think about that when you were saying you went to the movies and Sometimes I forget that the kids are like my kids and not my friends. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's a constant learning process. I'm not letting my grandchildren watch uh, The Untouchables, believe me. Uh, they're not <laughs> watching that scene. That, that oh. they will not see. You know what? One thing I do want to tell you, though, before I forget, oh, you mentioned that you can't. Hang on. UConn had a player that was suffering from the flu. Teddy, please. 
if they're not taking AG1 by Athletic Greens, you're letting them you're right. down. You're doing them you're a right. disservice. Right. AG1, UConn, please get together. Make sure this team has Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code ATLAS, uh, athleticgreens.com slash ATLAS, and get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. So when you're in the on the road in the Final Four playing for a national championship, you can take Athletic Greens in the morning. It's got 75 whole food sourced ingredients. This stuff keeps your health, your immune system in check. Consider it like an inexpensive security policy for your own health and your immunity system. I take this stuff every single day. You mix it up in the morning, eight to 10 ounces of water. It tastes great, easy to drink, totally convenient. You don't need any other supplements. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas and get the 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. They'll send you a big bag. Like this, you mix it with a scoop of water, boom, you're done. Everything you need, athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Go I'm sure. You say, Teddy? No, 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 and Danny Hurley, he's probably got him on it because Danny Hurley is, uh, well, I said that in, in October too. I said he's the best coach there is in basketball, and now he's starting to get some uh, attention in those areas towards that and getting, as you said, some luck. It'd be nice to see him in the NBA next year because you know that's coming. Hey, listen, he, he, he's committed right there right now, and he, he wants to maybe build a dynasty there, which would be for sure, which would be pretty damn good. But you know, but always nice to have one, options. No, of course. Hey, success breed, breeds options. You know, one thing about Danny, he comes from, well, he comes from a, just a, a family that, you know, all they do is, is make basketball stars and basketball genius. Is the father, start with the father. Bobby Senior, you know, yep. he ran a program at St. Anthony's in Jersey City um, with kids that come from very impoverished backgrounds, and it became a, a factory to put kids into college. He yeah, they had a bunch kids. of African. They oh, have a bunch of African superstars came through there well, too. He he got them all into college. He got them yeah. degrees. You know, they didn't all go in the NBA, but they all went to college. And the father did that. He was there for like fifty years, whatever it was, and um, just a legend. And then, of course, his son, Bobby Jr., uh, one of the greatest point guards in the history of college basketball. They won two national titles in Duke. I mean, he was unbelievable. And he would have been a great NBA player. Uh, he got drafted in the top. Uh, and then he had a car accident, head-on collision. He almost died. And it was incredible. He came back and still played in the NBA. He didn't have the career he would have had, but he can't. And, and Danny was a player, too, played for Seton Hall. And... Uh, so it's in the blood, baby. It's in the blood. It's, it's I'll tell caught. you one thing, though, Teddy. At that level, if you don't win, they don't care where you came from. So there will be those critics out there and haters. That you, you'll never meet a hater doing better than you, I'll tell you that. But there will be plenty of people out there. Oh, he had it easy. He came from a dynasty family. Guess what? If you don't win, oh, you work they're going to... They're gonna shit can you so fast your head'll spin. But to go in he there didn't and take, have it easy, I think, though. he he went through the he went through the road. I get what you're saying, but he went through the back roads. You know, I know he that. went in these he Danny went into all these little schools. <laughs> he was a coach in high school and then he went to those little schools. The simpletons are just going to see him playing for a national title. They're not gonna know the hustle and everything that went well, with it. And, but that's uh, always the case. Yeah. That's and, always uh, the case. You know, at that level, at that level, you just have to win. And it's special in college because the kids change every year. It's not like the NBA team where you can build, put well, building true. blocks in, add a piece here, add a piece there. Right. You got guy Going plays done. really well, goodbye. He's gone to the NBA, so now you got to get a new one. That's why I think coaches like Saban and uh, Dabo Sweeney that can build dynasties in college are very unique. And that's, that's what why Hurley, doing. what Hurley did here was incredible because. They didn't have that ability. Their program had been on the downslide a little bit. UConn had won national Big titles. Time. It's been a long time. And they won the downslide. And then he's been there now. This will be his fifth year. And he came in. He had to change the culture. He had to, you know, For and sure. he didn't have the automatic recruiting that that these teams like Duke and Kentucky and North Carolina get where they get all the McDonald All Americans. He didn't have that. That's what makes it. That's what makes it so special. That's what I wanted to highlight. Is this is unique? And he selected the guys he wanted. He selected, which I I recognized as soon as I spoke to them. 
He selected guys with character. Like I said, of course they can play basketball. No kidding. Division one athletes. <laughs> but he also selected guys that were selfless, guys that would be team players, guys that would accept their roles, guys that were intelligent, guys that would allow themselves to be coached. You know, and that's that's part of that's part of why he's there right now. And uh but I w- I wanna real quick say also you had an incredible Really, an incredible weekend, an incredible day. I believe it was Friday, but it was Friday or Saturday. Yeah. But where you flew into Boston with your 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 whole crew there, all your boys. Uh, the girl didn't go, but all your boys, big, big, big Boston Celtic fans. Their dad gave them the trip of their life, the moment of their. They're never going to forget it. You know, mm-hmm. Flew them all in for the Boston Celtic game. Sat on the court. Unbelievable. You sent me some videos. But the greatest thing was seeing the smiles on their faces and seeing their wardrobes, what they were <laughs> dressed in. They were fanatical. With their <laughs> cute little kids being fanatical. You know, the guys that are 40 and 50 dressed up, great, that's not as cute. Not quite. I mean, it's, it's I almost it. sad. <laughs> it's almost sad. That's a good one. But, but to see those little tykes. Your little guys come in there dressed dress in like leprechauns, you know, with the, the Boston Celtic uh, attire, with all the stuff, with the hat, with the glasses, with the shamrocks, with the <laughs> green, with the um, – it, it really did my heart well. It, it was – I showed it to my wife. I showed it to my kids. <laughs> it was – it was – you you get the dad of at least the dad of the month. <laughs> Thanks, Teddy. Yeah, we flew to Boston on Friday in the middle. Uh, Friday morning, went to the Celtics game Friday night. My friend Mark Moran got us like front row tickets just off to the side of the court. And the, my youngest kid, he's he's a unique kid. He's the one who's into the jujitsu. So Teddy, he'll train jujitsu four or five nights a week. Uh, and now in the su- well. in the summer, he's going to a sewing class for a week. He just. He's just wow. like confidence. He's eclectic. He doesn't wow. care what other people like. You can tell people, I don't care what That's anyone great. thinks. This kid genuinely is like, he's all boy, but he's like, yeah, dad, I want to sew. Like, I want to make my own clothes. I want to start great. my own clothing line someday. <laughs> so he'll like choke you unconscious and then sew your pair of boxer shorts. And he, so great. he says, I want to wear this leprechaun suit to the game. Now, in theory, you think, okay. But I think he's gonna like he's gonna get too nervous. This little sucker, he wore that leprechaun suit from the morning when he woke up on the airplane to the game to the hotel. Everywhere we went, people were like looking at him like, and he had no cares in the world. He was like, "Hey, what's up?" He's high five and people. He gave Jason Tatum a knuckle bump. He's like, "Dad, I'm gonna get Jason Tatum." I'm gonna tell Jason Tatum if he gives me his jersey, I'll take a selfie with him. I said, "Oh, that ought to get his attention." (laughs) (laughs) Of course, but they had the best time, and it was uh... children, the purity of children, (laughs) just the magic of children, and then. And then they grow up and become like us. That's, that's yep. unfortunate. <laughs> but but uh, we're trying. Such a fun you know, we're time. trying yep. to be uh, to be like better, like they are. But no, it was beautiful. I told them you say it hello. They said, "Dad, make a video. We'll send them a video." So they wanted to tell you, like, "Hey, Teddy, we're at the game. What's up?" Oh, they did. It was beautiful. And the yeah. one last thing is, I told you, I sent you a text. Yeah. You knew the Celtics had to win that night. You mm. knew they had to win. Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, and, that and was, it was so much fun. Like you said, it was <laughs> like I can remember going to my first game, that, and we were in the nosebleeds. I mean, the thought of going and sitting down that close to the game was just. I don't know. It's like magical to me because I know what I thought about as a kid. Like I just didn't have that luxury, and to be able to do these things for them is just—it's never it's, lost on me. It makes me forget emotional, choked uh, up just thinking a, about I, it. It is. It's a blessing. It's a. It's a blessing, and you work yep. hard to make that blessing possible. So that's, that's the key. Confides. Yep. Anthony Joshua does what Anthony Joshua does. Uh, I hesitate to say boring as hell because I don't like to be critical but I mean it was just like I'd rather watch paint dry I'm sorry it just was nothing if I enter Jermaine Franklin like get him out of there you want to impress and get the next fight like don't come with this like let me just get through this like like the Ruiz fight part two I'm just gonna do what I have to do to win I get it you gotta win but man there has to be I want to have a reason to watch and tune in right now I don't have a reason to tune in unless it's like to see maybe Fury beat him or Wilder beat him again like or wilder to be like i just i want to get excited about aj fights and they always have the same kind of have the same result just like very 
robotic almost. He wins uh, 117, 111 on two cards, 118, hey, 111 on the too. third. The Klitschko's weren't exactly houses on fire when they were. I'd say they were. I'd they say were the winning. Klitschko's. I'd say the Klitschko's were worse. No, no, I'm they not. Were, to they defend, were more. No, more I, boring. I got to defend them a little bit. Uh, not defend them, but at least point that out. But um. Listen, I agree with you on that. They were, it was like, just boring to watch. That's why that uh, heavyweight you, division listen, during their era was dead. It was two guys playing chess who were better at checkers. Yep. All right. Um, that should that should go over well with our great British fans. Who, and just uh, for the we record, love. we both like AJ. There's nothing not to like. I just no, wish he'd bring some he's fireworks when he's supposed no, he's to stop done. someone. Stop him. Hey, he behaves like a gentleman, and that's beautiful. But we, we, we're not here to just only talk about that part. We're talking about x-rays, x-ray and, you know, the performance uh, in the ring, uh, in all aspects of it. And uh, quite frankly, you know, there was some damage maybe done because I try to cover everything. There was some damage done after he got knocked out by Andy Ruiz. But like Canelo, he's overrated. And maybe we expect too much. But the fans, you can overrate them because you're fans. You know what I mean? You could drink that that lemonade, that whatever it is they serve over there in, in, in the UK instead of lemonade, whatever it might be. But you, that's fine. I get it. I'm with you. But we ain't drinking it. And I'm definitely not drinking because my job is to be to analyze this stuff and to bring the truth as I know it. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's the truth as I know as my 50 years of experience tell me. And it's, you know, it's unbiased. It's it's got nothing to do with anything but what it's got to do with. What's happening in that squared circle in this particular case. And this is a guy that, you know, they put him up, they put him up on this this high pedestal, which happens, but again. Who did he beat? He he beat Charles Martin to win the heavyweight title. He got dropped by a 42-year-old Klitschko. Now, look, Klitschko could still punch like Foreman could still punch. He knocked my guy out when he was 45. I get it. I get it. And he showed a lot of heart in that Klitschko fight. He did. He got up off the floor. But he defended his title against guys like Dominic Brazil, who got knocked out in one or two rounds by Wilder. Of course, he knocked out Brazil, too which he should have done, of course. You know, Joshua, he, he got to do But then he defended against Eric Molina. Carlos, take him. Ta- took, take him, whatever. Take him. You take him. I'm not taking him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wh- whatever. I mean, not exactly. I mean, I don't know. Not exactly a who's who. You know, maybe a who is that? Maybe you ask, well, who is that? Rather than a who's who's list of great heavyweights, but for all of that, they put him on this thing, especially the British fans, but, and I get it. I get the promoter. He's making money. I understand, but you put him on a Mount Rushmore of great fighters. I mean, start off maybe with a, a hill, right? Not a mount. Maybe after what I just listed there, Maybe Hillsmore. I think that's a small community college out west somewhere. I, I, I'm not sure. I think it is. But that, again, I'm not going to – I'm joking. I'm making a little humor with it. He's he's made millions and millions and millions of dollars. That's part of his problem too. There is no urgency there anymore, to your point where, you know, he's doing just enough to get by. There is no urgency there. Some people have urgency, like Michael Jordan. There's not a million Michael Jordans around that no matter what he made, he owns Nike freaking sneaker company. He's still looking to pull your lung out. <laughs> he's still he's still looking to be that kung fu guy that reaches into your chest and pulls your damn heart out and then steps on it. I mean, there's no matter what, he's that's there's not a lot of guys like that in this world in any vocation of you know wherever they are much less in boxing so it was a great crowd again 
these fighters and heavyweights in the UK, they're all millionaires, you know, uh, you know, thanks to the incredible fans over there, you know, as, as I, I've said before, you know, Fury and Joshua could fight the doorman at one of the hotels there <laughs> and, and still, you know, sell 50,000 seats. So uh, they're incredible. The fans, they really are. It's, it's, it's I, I applaud them. Uh, but that's why there's no pressure on Joshua to ever fight a wilder. You know, I know he's talking about Fury, whatever, but to fight a wilder, or for that matter, to fight a, even a Joe Joyce. I mean, not that that would be big money, but, I mean, or even Usyk. I mean, not that they want to see that again, but he's got the option, just like Fury, just like Canelo, of fighting anyone for less risk and still great reward. That usually don't happen. Usually you got to take great risks to get great reward. You don't have to do that if you're one of those guys over there that's set up the way that, uh, you know, that a Joshua is set up, a Fury set up. The fans will come no matter what. You, you know, my, what was that movie? Uh, what was that movie where in Iowa was somewhere? Where Field of, Field dreams. of dreams. dreams. If you build Field it, they will dream. come. Build it, they will come. Just, just put those guys' name on a poster. People will come. People will come. So, and like I said, Canelo has that same privilege too. You know, that's why he's not in a hurry to get in the ring with better feeders. He can instead fight John Ryder. You know, and I'm not knocking John Ryder. He'll give a good effort, but is that the fight we really want to see? I, I tweeted it out. I'm not interested in seeing whether it's Joshua, whether it's Fury, whether it's the bigger, um, even the even the middleweight. Um, um, what's his name? Brother, the the two brothers, um, Callum Smith. No, the brothers in in the states. Um, uh, the middleweight and the junior Charlie. Age. Yeah, I'm not interested in seeing whether it's Charlo, and I'm not knocking him. I like them, but I'm not interested in seeing Charlo. I'm not interested in seeing, as I said, Joshua, Fury, Canelo. I'm not interested in seeing those guys at this point, at this junction, fight anybody but the elite guys. I'm just not interested. I was going to say, because I was going to say, agreed, but I am interested in seeing it, the, all those guys fight the best competition in it. I want to see Charlo of course, and Canelo. I want, I want to see Fury and saying. Wilder, you're, Joshua, I mean, Usyk. echoing what I just said. I know. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm agreeing with you. I'm telling you, I think that that's, I think that that, that that's representative of what the, all the fans want, myself included. Is like, let's just have the best guys fight in the best, even if you have to make a couple extra dollars. Being great, your legacy lives forever. Be great. You'll be like Sugar Ray Leonard. You'll be selling your house for $50 million when you're in your 60s. You'll have a career beyond boxing. You'll be great. Hopefully you won't, you won't just be it. like, right, but you know what I'm saying? You won't just have a couple yeah. shekels extra for this one big fight. When you're great, brands want to be associated with you. There's a career after boxing. When you just take the safe route and try to maximize every single earning potential. It's like what we just talked about with the Bruins. These guys are giving up eight to $10 million just for the idea of possibly wearing the Stanley Cup ring because that'll live with them for the rest of their life. You keep that with you everywhere you go, hey, yeah, what's that ring? Oh, I want a Stanley that's Cup. That's the mentality that's of those guys, of Michael Jordan, who I just pointed out, of those type guys. You know, that's not everyone has that mentality. Not everybody. You're right. So You're right. Bottom line, here's the analysis. Franklin was chosen. I'm not knocking Franklin. He did, you know, he did what he did. He went in there, he went to distance just like he did with Dayan White. And gave a decent, well, against White, he gave probably a better performance. But look, Franklin was chosen by Joshua for a reason. He gained credibility with the fight I just talked about with the fans by performing well a few months ago in that losing effort to Dayan White so they could sell this. And his lack of power, Franklin, and his lack of experience against good opposition made him a, a safe opponent to get an easy payday and stay active. That's what it was about. I mean, 
I, you know, and that's pretty much what it pay, played out to be. Franklin just doesn't have enough confidence or experience yet to get it done at this at any level above what he was doing when it, you know when they were building his record up because of that he and because of that he blew a huge opportunity to pull off a big upset because I'm going to tell you something I don't care if you didn't see this then I don't know what you were drinking over there at the crowd. Maybe, you know, I get it. You're going to have a few Guinnesses. You're going to have, but if you don't see the vulnerability in Joshua, either you're not looking or you don't know what to be looking at. You just don't know. Or you're just a crazy fan that as long as your guy gets the W, he's great. And that's all you care about. You know, you you don't look at it in any kind of other way, and and that's fine. But that's not fine for us. We have to look at it in a, a critiquing way for the fans for this show. And he's a vulnerable guy, Joshua. You know, early on, he gets hit a right hand. He got hit a lot of right hands. He's not hard to hit with right hands. He is Franklin, but. He gets hit a right hand early, Joshua, and he gets a bloody nose. He was so tentative after that for a few rounds. You could, I mean, you could see it. If if the corner could have lit a fire under Franklin, but maybe there's maybe there's no tinder to light. I don't know the guy. Maybe there's no coal there to light. I don't know. Or maybe it's what I said earlier. I'm giving them the benefit that you don't have to experience the confidence. I have to be built up enough. Not yet. Maybe, maybe a little, maybe next. Maybe. That's what you would hope for. But if they could have lit a little fire, if he himself had that in him, man, it was doable. It was doable. Why? I just said why. You can hit him with right hands, Joshua. He was tentative. He was unsure if you just had that audacity, that that fire, that confidence, that belief, which he didn't have. So forget about it. No sense in talking about it, I guess. But if you did, man, you didn't have to be the greatest fighter in the world. You just had to be a guy that had a decent chin, had that kind of heart, that kind of hunger, and chucked punches. I'll use that word again. Chucked punches, threw punches. And you would have had a good chance. Good chance. A winnable, winnable fight. And again, the truth be spoken, Franklin had to make a choice, really. And I tweeted this. At that moment, he had to make a choice to just survive, just do enough. I've been there. I've been there with fighters. I, I Sometimes you got to remind them of that. You know, it's... I mean, the training is over. You taught him what you taught him in the gym. But sometimes now it's the mental part in the corner that you just got to motivate him. Whatever you got to do, you got to shake him up. But it came down to he had to make a choice to either just survive, do just enough to lose well, which, you know, I guess you could make an argument he did, or try to win, which, what does that mean? That means... You got to take risk. And he chose to do enough to survive. And as I said, there were spots where Franklin scored with single right hands, but he just never put anything behind it. Never followed up. Matter of fact, I'm going to go deeper with the analysis. Real simple. I would have loved the commentators to touch on this. When he got hit, Franklin, he behaved like a fighter. He came right back with some fire. Came right back. And he got hit with the right hand by Joshua, who used to really put guys away with those right hands. I don't know if Franklin's got that good a chin, or he just ain't thrown with bad intentions like he used to. And and he's fighting better fighters, too. Maybe that's part of it now, you know, Joshua. But whatever it is, whatever it is, I try to cover it all. When he got hit, when Franklin got hit with, with those shots, he came right back, pop, 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 came right back, and then he stopped. That was the end of it. I would have liked to see that fire 
that attitude with the initiative where he didn't wait to get hit, where he would have done it, you know, as we say in boxing, get off first. Simplest thing you can say, hey, get off first. If he would have just got off first more, if he would have just, instead of waiting till he got hit to react that way, and I give him credit for the way he reacted, do that, initiate the attacks, start the attacks. Don't just finish them. Start them with that. If I was commentating, that's what I would have been talking about. But uh, I never followed up with anything, really, uh, whether reacting, coming back, he, he stopped. Or whether, when, like I said, he, he didn't have a problem landing the right hand. Never put a hook behind it. Never put all the punches behind it. Uh, I, I, I thought that um, I thought that also on the other side of the street, if you will, the other flip side to the fight, Joshua was setting the table with the jab. The jab was very, very important in this fight. I tweeted it from the beginning with my great tweet team there of Twitter. The jab was so important. Joshua used his a little more. Um, they both could use it. They both could be effective with it. It was just a matter of using it and being consistent. And Joshua was basically doing a very, very basic job of carrying the rounds by setting the table with his jab and then eating with the right hand with no follow-ups. Again, no follow-ups for him either. Being satisfied just to do enough to get by, to have a little lead. You know, no, no fire, no killer instinct to use an old, old phrase. You know, no hunger to, that was evident, no urgency. All right, he won. He won. That, that's the listen. I get it. That's the bottom line. Get the W. And I know the fans are happy. You got and Eddie Hearns is happy. You got the W. But to the credit of the commentators, they were even saying, to their credit, they were being honest. They were saying, hey, you know, he's supposed to do a little more, a little more, if we're to believe that he's the judge who everyone wanted us to believe, that he's this, you know, great heavyweight that was supposed to be this. You know, gaga over. You know, which one can gaga over? <laughs> if he really is, he got to do a little more than that. He showed so, more passion in the interview after the Usyk fight than he did in any of his fights. Right. And I like Joshua. <clears throat> I don't want to be too critical, but I mean, come on, man. No, Give us listen, a reason to get excited. Franklin showed more passion after the fight when. Joshua slapped him in the back of the head. He didn't do anything bad, but he gave him a little tap on the back of the head. And, and then Franklin went after him. And then the corner man, you know, went after him a little bit. But I wish Franklin would have showed a little bit of that, that fire, you know, during the fight. He, he might have been leaving there with the win, yep. you know, if he had. But look. Well, he wasn't going to win a decision. Even if he knocked him out, he would have been lucky to get a split decision. So that well, wasn't he, possible, but he could have fought with he, more passion, knocked, that's for sure. Yeah, maybe. If he knocked him out, he might have got disqualified for knocking him out. I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> sure. But at the end of the day, to follow up on the firm analysis of it, which you probably don't even need because it spoke for itself, uh, the fight, but pretty simplistic, pretty conventional. The jab, the right hand, no follow-ups. Um, the right hand also by Franklin, no follow-ups, but more of it by Joshua. He won the fight. He carried the rounds. He did a little more. He did He did enough. He did just enough to win, to get by, to win. And the other guy did just enough to lose. I, I know that yep. sounds harsh, but it also rings true. And – there's room for improvement with Franklin. He's still a work in progress where, you know, now he's had two fights on this stage at this level. Let's see if that kicks in. See, uh, as a trainer, that's, I want to see now, does that kick in? 
But Teddy, the one thing that I want to point out and the one the one variable that seems to be missing. And listen, this is what we, we you talked about it earlier. Part of the impetus for this podcast was to connect the dots of life. And a lot of people, a lot of good people that we all know live their life like this. They're surviving. They're not living. They're not like they're not like squeezing every ounce of juice. They're getting from Monday to Friday and then getting bombed on Friday night and they're just surviving. They don't want to like risk risk it all to be great. And listen, that's just that's the safe route for some people. They well, want to have so that. Frankly, you're right. But, yeah, but and for Joshua, you can't teach they, that. You can't be, teach Joshua. passion. Joshua's got enough money now for 14 lifetimes. Agreed. Unless he goes, unless he goes out there and loses his mind. Nah, and he's, Joshua, you can tell he's not going to lose. He's, yeah, got, he's, got, he's a, got it going. No, no, no. And God bless him. But good. Yeah. You never want no one to go that that route. But Joshua, he, you know, he ain't Michael Jordan where it still matters. You know, he's made enough money and 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 it, 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 you can see it. You can see it. That's that's the end. Listen. There was no change with the new trainer that Joshua got. Everything was the same. And I think he's a good trainer, the guy. James, whatever his name is. He's a good trainer. He does a good job. But there's no change. You want to know why? Because they're opening the hood to the car, and they're working on the brakes, and they're working on the carburetor, and that's not the problem. It's, it's the engine. It's this. It's the brain. That's what it is. And until they get, and there's not a lot of guys that could do that, but until they get somebody to work on that part, on the engine, on the brain, believe me, the car ain't running no faster. The car ain't, ain't driving the way they want it to drive until they fix that. That that's nope. the that is really the key. Seventy five percent of this, whether there's MMA, anything in life where there's consequence where there's threat where there's risk the word you just said risk 75 percent of it because of what is involved in that environment 70 what comes with it 75 percent of it is mental handling yourself as a lawyer in a courtroom in a big case a teacher in a classroom with crazy kids what, whatever, <laughs> a doctor, when he opens up the patient in the operating room and there's arteries bleeding where they ain't supposed to be bleeding, that's mental. That's You already know your science. You already know your anatomy. That's being able to hold yourself mentally. That's that's being able to, to keep it together on, on that level. That's called being a real pro, a real pro, not just making money but a real pro and not everyone gets there. And I'll tell you until they do that, Josh was just going to stay it ain't changing. And, and, and you know what? A, you're not getting on to do it. There's, there's very few people that could do the job and B, they wouldn't be allowed to do the job because he's made too much money. You don't want to hear it. They wouldn't be allowed to do the job. And there's very few people, A, if they knew how to do the job would take the risk on their part, on their part. There's risk emotionally, money-wise, and physical. There's risk in a lot of different areas, a lot of, lot, lot of different dimensions. It's not just the risk of getting hit with a punch. It's the risk of a trainer. Say he did not know that he's going to tell a guy who's, who's made all this money, right, who's won the world title, he's going to tell him things that he don't want to hear, that he might get fired for telling him, that he might lose his payday. For telling him, tell me the guy you're going to find. Point him out, because I'd like to see that guy that's going to do that. I'd like to see. There's not a lot of them out there, Ken, who's going to do that. That A, knows the terrain, that knows what to talk about, what to do, what has to be done, knows what the doctor ordered to fix the patient, and B, has the guts to tell him when he might lose his freaking job for telling him. As, as you're talking about that, it reminds me of a quote, and this isn't to imply that Anthony Joshua is mediocre, but sometimes no matter how great you are, you can get into that mediocre mindset. And I think about mediocrity is invisible until passion shows up and exposes it. And one thing that I forgot to mention earlier in the show is one of our biggest fans, a huge fight fan, my friend Jelly Roll across the street, 
He won three country music awards last night. And when he got up there on the first one at the microphone, he said, they let a loser win tonight, baby. He's been a drug addict in prison. He's been making music 30, right, 30 years as an independent artist. The first year he signs with a label. Last year, he gets a little label push behind him. Show me where you've been. Show me where where you're going. Show me where you got to. And, And that's a winner. That's and that's what he was He's saying is that you just described the winner. That's yep. a winner. Even more so that he was in those places and he got to this place. That's a winner. That's what we're talking about. What he said to me last week, he's like, Ken, you think that I don't know these people wouldn't piss on me if I was on fire for 30 years. Now I have the the the, the institution oh, behind me. Bless. He goes, you think all these people want to be my friends? They just know that I'm in a position now where I can help them. Now all of a sudden I got all these new friends. Yeah, sure. So that was his way of saying, they let a loser win. I know you guys thought I was a loser, but here I am. I'm the winner, baby. Yeah. And it was just so great to see. Such a good no, person. Beautiful. I just I'm wish everyone could gave, see I'm how kind this guy is. I'm glad He's you gave the, Hey, Jelly. Keep the it up, Jelly. Guy. You're the man. Um, come it. to my foundation dinner and help us raise money for a lot of underprivileged people and a lot of sick people and a lot of people that fall through the cracks and some people that were in dark places like you used to be that we're trying to put the light on for them. Come come to our come in November, the week before Thanksgiving, and and help us raise money for those people. Ken will be there, Rob will be That's there. That's right. Never miss it. Now Jelly's a big private jet guy. Maybe we'll fly up there together. Let's go, Jason. His real name is Jason DeFord, by the way. Congratulations to Jason. When I moved here, Teddy, we could go anywhere we wanted. No, he, a few people would ask for a picture here and there. Now he's selling out Nashville, uh, Bridgestone Arena. He's winning country music Beautiful. awards. It's just crazy to like see to a little tweak like to and you're on that. top of the world. But if you stay with that mediocre mindset and don't keep grinding and believing in yourself, blind faith for 30 years. Years, Teddy selling CDs out of the back of his car. He was living in a van like five years ago or ten years ago, something like he, this. He was on the balls of his ass, just kept believing in himself, and it happened. And it happened. So anyway, congratulations, Jelly Roll. Congratulations, Jelly, and um, that's great. Listen, to finish up this analysis, yeah. Joshua, one of his flaws, he stands too erect. He, you know, he looks good. He, he's got that. Europeans, that English proper look straight up. But the thing that goes along with it sometimes is you can get hit with right hands. I tweeted that I that Franklin should throw a right hand to the body, get get his attention there, get you know get the respect that he's going to go there to the body from Joshua. Throw a right hand to the body, and then later on in the fight, later on in the round. Bend like he's going to throw it to the body, Ken, and instead throw it to the head. And he had catch Joshua standing erect, standing straight. And he might even drop him because he'd never see the punch. He tried it one time. He tried it one time. Uh, and um, it, it just missed. But if he would have tried it more, I would have been interested to see if he would have had some success because you can do that with Josh because he does stand erect. Um, he... He not only landed the right hand, as the fight got late, the right uppercut was there for Joshua. And it made sense. It made sense because Franklin's shorter, smaller man. And he comes in, you know, on a straight line. He leans a tiny bit, used the uppercut. And sure enough, to Joshua's credit, he he went to it. And he landed it. But he didn't use it enough. And again, he, there was no follow-up. You know, you hit him with a straight right hand up top, follow with a left hook. You hit him with a right uppercut, put a left hook with it. Put something with it. You bring his head up, chop it off with the next punch. You know, but that's what won the rounds for him. The use of the jab, the use of the straight right hand, and the use of the, again, very standard, very, I guess you could say pedestrian, but, you know, conventional. But it was it was enough. It was enough. Uh, you know, for him, for him to to carry the rounds, and you know, to get that win, that vulnerability of Joshua for the right hand. That's one of the reasons. Besides the reason that he's made so much money, he don't need to do this. But you never see him with Wilder. You never see him with Wilder ever. Um, 
I mean, I, 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 if I was backing him, I don't know that I'd want to put him in there with Wado either, to be quite frank, um, with the kind of right hand that Wado chucks. And, and as I said, uh, a susceptibility that he has to getting hit with the right hand. And, and, you, and I said it earlier, I don't think you're ever going to see him with Joyce. Uh, again, I know that's not a big money fight, but Joyce is, you know, undefeated silver medalist. He's getting older. He's already about 38 years old. Um, but you're not going to see that either. I, I think Waddle or Joyce would, and it's a, not a knock on him, but I think they would knock him out. You know, I I think that, as I said, Josh was uh, limited to, you know, to what he's limited to right now. I'm not saying he struggled with Franklin, but if he's not going to light up the skies against a guy like Franklin, it kind of tells you what you need to know, right? I know there'll be when he gets in there with the next level again, right? I mean, you know, he got beat the last two fights before this by Usyk, a cruiserweight who's now heavyweight champ, special guy, but he got beat twice by them. He got knocked out, as we said, by Andy Ruiz going back, and he came back from it. You know, all credit to him. But at this junction in his life and career, uh, you know, I would you see with Franklin, you're not getting much more. And I know there'd be an argument to say, but Teddy, some guys fight up to their competition. All right. Some guys, when he's in there with the next level, you know, it'll kick in because he know that it has to kick in. That that's fair. I just don't know that's the case anymore. Uh with with this man. I I don't. Well, let's jump over to a preview of this week's coming um UFC pay-per-view and a guy who always brings the passion and has that win or die trying mentality. One other thing the, I want to throw in there. Yeah, Can I ahead. add one thing? Yeah, of course. A huge, huge problem for me. To finish my analysis for Franklin, I already, you know, went over everything with Joshua. For Franklin, if he was going to win that fight, he had, he's a shorter man. When he got inside, Ken, if he's going to win that fight, he had to punch when he got inside. He allowed Joshua to tie him up and went along with it all night long. It drove me crazy. It's a basic thing. It's mental. It's technical. It's physical because he didn't do it physically. He didn't do it technically, but it's mental because what you're doing when your best chance to win and you're the shorter guy and you get inside with the bigger guy and you don't punch and you put your hands behind him and you allow the other guy to tie you up and you go along with that. You know what you're doing? Well, you're blowing your opportunity. We know that. But you know what you're doing? You're making a silent agreement. Y'all, I know no one else talks about this. You're making a silent agreement. You don't hit me, I won't hit you. And when you make silent agreement, what you're also agreeing to is you can't win. That you that you can't win. In that position, you can't win. That if that's what you need to do to put you over the top, it ain't you can't win that. You can't win. So, yeah, you're making a silent agreement because it's safer. It's safer. But at the end of the day, if I'm the guy's trainer, you know what I'm telling him? It's safer, huh? It's safer. Okay. It also makes you poorer, but you think it's safer. You think it's safer for that moment. But you're going to be alone at 2 in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, where all by yourself one day, maybe a week from now, maybe a year from now, 10 years from now, and you're going to look back. And you know what's not going to be safe? Is remembering that you made a silent agreement instead on that particular night saying no agreements tonight. I'm going for it. I'm going to find out if I can do it. I'm giving myself the best chance to win this freaking thing for myself, for my family, for my future. I'm going to find out. Yeah, by punching inside, maybe I'll wind up getting caught. Maybe. But I will also find out if I can do enough to win. I'm going to find out if I can win this position, this fight, 
in this particular position. I was going to say the title. It wasn't for the title. But I'm going to find out right now. And it's a bigger risk not to find out, to always regret that moment. That's a big risk. That's something that will never go away with. That's a bigger risk than throwing the punches at that moment. That's what I would tell the fighter. But not too many people are going to tell a fighter that. If you don't hit yep, me, I, I won't hit you. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good until it's not good. Until you get out of the locker room and you're on your way home all alone. And you said, what if? What if? Yep. Well, one guy that very rarely says what if is Israel Adesanya. And to that extent, Alex Perea, those are two guys that let their hands go and leave it all in the cage every time, every time, every time. You know what you're getting with them. Fight to the death. Um, they're now... Uh, Izzy's now 0-3, Alex Perea 3-0 against Israel Adesanya. They had two kickboxing fights. One was a disputed decision. Alex Perea knocked Izzy out in the second one. I believe Izzy was probably winning that second fight. And like I said, the first decision was hotly disputed. And then in, the, in their MMA fight at UFC, uh, I don't know what number it was, but we were together at the Garden watching that one in the ESPN booth. And I would say that Israel won probably, if he got knocked out in the 28th minute, he, he won 26 or 27 minutes of that fight. Uh, and they're rematching. And this preview is brought, brought to you by MyBookie. Go to MyBookie.ag if you want to bet on any of the fights. Use the promo code ATLAS for a 50% credit on your first deposit. My bookie has lines on all the biggest fights, including the Israel Adesanya Alex Perea matchup, and we'll get your prediction in a minute, Teddy. But something to think about before we get to it: Izzy, a slight favorite at minus one forty to plus one ten for Perea, which I think makes sense because, like I said, Izzy's winning that fight for the majority of the fight, and he just like like you've said many times, when you're in there with these kind of guys, you have to be perfect. One little mistake, one little opening, and Perea tr turns the lights off. Um, tell me what you're looking for, what to expect, and we'll get the prediction at the end. And I'll give you the over-under at the end, too, for the people at my bookie. We got to do the deep dive. You got to do the dive, the real yep. dive. It ain't just physical and technical. It's this. It's mental. The first thing that Adesanya, the toughest task for him is to he, – he needs exorcism. You know, I love him. He's been on our show. I'm rooting for him. I don't know the other guy, but I'm rooting for him. I'm sure the other guy's a good guy, too. But I'm rooting for Adesanya. He's special. He's a special athlete. He's a special winner. He's a special champion. He's a special person. He is. But you need an exorcism. He's got to get the ghost out of the attic. And there are ghosts in the attic right now. You know, it's not just that he got knocked out in this fight. He got knocked out before that in the amateurs or whatever that was before the UFC. Whatever that fight was, he got beat twice before this. Once, I believe, a decision, and once he got knocked out. I don't know if that was in the amateurs. I don't know if that was in another... Um, you professional know, kickboxing, both yeah, of professional those fights. Kickboxing, I don't know Yeah, what it was, but it was before the UFC. That that's, that's still there. That That's in his attic. He's got to get... Again, he's got to get those ghosts out of his attic. That's the main thing. He's got the ability. He's got the technique. Now, the guy's a big guy. He's a good puncher. He can't make mistakes. Very similar to the fight plan that we, we just did, Ken. You were there in the gym with me. That we just did with Tank Davis. It's going to be shown pretty soon. We're going to be putting it up pretty soon before the Tank Davis and Garcia fight. Very similar fight plan. He's got to beat Garcia. You know, he's got to control the outside. He can't make mistakes. You know, he's got to keep more balance. Always know how dangerous Tank Davis is. Same thing. Same thing. He's got to keep more balance. He's got to keep Pereira off balance. Use his mobility. You know, get in, get out. Move off to the sides. Don't stay in, in front of him too long, you know, in the pocket. He's got to, I mean, if he gets in the pocket, I know that it's, it's different tying a guy up. You know, you want to tie a guy up if you don't want to let him be dangerous inside in the ring. So you tie him up. Uh, in this case, maybe he goes to the – I don't know if he goes to the floor. Just, I know he's he's not a master on the floor, is he? But I also know he's got great ability to survive on the mat, uh, that he knows how to – he's got good takedown defense. 
Uh, I know he's been he's worked at that. He's very good. But his thing is striking, speed and striking. But maybe if they do get close, he, he ties them up. He gets on the floor just to kill a little time, then gets back to, again, being Muhammad Ali, being Ryan Garcia, controlling the outside, keeping them off balance, not, you know, not giving them a chance to, to land that big shot. Uh, but the key to do that, again, yeah, I'm going to repeat it because it's worth repeating. Get the ghost out of the freaking attic. There's certain guys that – that there was a fight years ago. You remember him? He was a top champion. I don't know if they had pound for pound. If they did, he would have been pound for pound one of the best. He beat the lawyer. Shane Mosley, he was a really good fighter. Oh, he was a, great he, guy. And his son, Shane Mosley Jr., is a world-class guy. He trains in Santa Monica. I was good friends with him when I lived out in L.A. You Love know Shane everybody, Mosley. so I knew right away that you, would, <laughs> that you would grab that and you'd run with it. All right. Now, because there's no one Ken doesn't know, by the way. So – he yeah, and he's getting bigger and bigger. His star just keeps getting brighter, uh, brighter All and brighter. I got to turn the lights off. So, <laughs> listen, he Shane Mosley was a top guy, and he fought a guy. God bless him. I, I want to say a prayer for him because he passed away, way way too young. Oh my God, Vernon Forrest. But he fought Vernon Forrest, and Shane Mosley was the favorite. Here's the thing where there's a similarity with what I'm talking about with Pereira and Adesanya, where Vernon Forrest had beaten Shane Mos- Mosley in the amateurs. That stayed with him. Now, listen, part of it was the style matchup, you know, that he, you could say he had his numbers. Certain people have certain people's numbers, Ken. They do. They And I'm making proof of it. They have, they. have I'm giving you something tangible here, proof, exhibit A in a courtroom to show it. They, they just have their number. And Vernon Forrest had made Mosley's number. Not just technically the way he fought. That was a part of it. The way that he approached it, the way he fought his technique, styles make fights. But also, mentally, he had beaten him. And what does he do? Even though Mosley was the favorite, he beats Mosley the first time they fight. He beats him the second time. And I remember when people were asking me about that. Teddy, who do you predict the second time? What do you think I said? Even though I thought Mosley was a better fighter, more explosive in a lot of areas, certain areas, although Forrest was a good, solid fighter and a big guy. But I said, I like Forrest again. He's got his number. He's, he's got bats in his belfry. He's got ghosts in, in his attic. You know, and, and, and sure enough, he won again. That's what you're dealing with here. That that you're dealing with that. That's that's the key. And as far as like you said, he was winning every minute of every round until he wasn't winning anymore. Bang. That's sudden. That was that that's that 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 shocks your consciousness. I mean, that reminded me a little bit of a boxing match years ago. That was that sudden was Big John Tate. He was heavyweight champ of the world. He was fighting Mike Weaver. And Mike Weaver, you know, was the underdog. And Hercules, what a body he had. And Weaver's winning the whole fight. Back in those days, it was a 15-round fight. So if it was 12, he would have still been champ. But it was 15. And in the 15th round, way ahead in the fight, Weaver, who could punch, just like Pereira, Hits him a left hook, Ken, and Tate fell like a tree in the forest. I mean, he fell face first, and he was out. It was a rocky moment. It was like a real life rocky moment. Uh, he way before Rocky was 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 made, and he he falls falls flat on his face. He gets out. That was the suddenness that I close to the suddenness that was in the Pereira out of Sanya fight. Of all of a sudden, like you said, he's winning, he's winning, he's winning, and then all of a sudden, he ain't winning. So for this fight, he's got to, you know, he's got to get rid of the ghost. He's got to um, keep more balance, not give Pereira the one thing he needs to be set in front of him where he can either catch him going straight back, coming in, or standing in front of him. Those three dimensions, don't give him that. Don't give him where you're coming in. He catch you coming in. He catch you going out. You know that old saying, I got him coming and going. Don't let him catch you coming or going. And don't stand in front of him. 
sides, angles, you know. Watch one of those old Western movies there, my friend. Is he, you know, I know you like watching movies. A lot of your fighters do. A lot of my fighters do before, you know, the days before. Keep himself busy. Watch more. Watch one of those old Westerns where, they, where the sheriff said, we got to get out of Dodge. I want you out of Dodge by noon. Get in and get out of Dodge. That's what you want to do is you get in and get out of Dodge. Keep, now, I know you want to hit him with something to hurt him, to hold him, to res, get get his respect. I get it. And you're a fighter. You're a champion. You got the character. You got all that. That's why I ain't betting against you because of that character. Even though I just led to most people would say, Teddy, you're picking Pereira. You made the perfect analogy, the perfect example with Vernon Forrest, and Mosley, that Forrest just had Mosley's number. He had his ticket, and and it, it stayed that way, and he couldn't beat him. I know I could go that road, and it sounds like I'm going that road, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Maybe it's because I like him, because it's personal. I try not to let those feelings get in the way, keep this whole business, you know, like the Godfather, Hyman Roth. Michael, it's 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 business. It ain't personal. It's business. I I think out of Sanya, if anyone can overcome it, I know he's we know he's got the technique and he's got the physicality. Although he does make mistakes technically, he drops his hands, you know. You can if you catch him, you can you can catch him clean because of that. Um, but he's very quick, he's very athletic, he's been a champion. He He's got the kind of mental makeup, the mental strength that I believe if anyone's going to overcome that, and he has to overcome that. Everything I just laid out, that's what this is about. That's, and, and I don't think all the people are going to lay it out. They're just going to lay out the, you know, the X's and O's part of it the, the, and the physical part. I get it. But it's, it's the mental realm. It's the mental realm. And if anyone is strong enough in that realm, I believe it's, I believe it's our friend Izzy, and and let I'm, me ask you this, Teddy, with the line for the people at my bookie, um, mybookie.ag, use promo code Atlas, fifty percent credit on your first deposit. Izzy is minus one forty versus a plus one ten for Perea. Do you like it enough to lay the wood? It's not a lot of wood, you know. It is Correct. forty minus one forty, but it's not minus three hundred or minus two fifty or. That kind of stuff that we get in a lot of fights. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I believe in them enough. You know, where I'm gonna lay the wood, and um, or I would lay the wood. And what is is there an over under or? Yeah, sorry, guy. Yeah, uh, over under the under is a slight favorite here at uh, minus one twenty eight under four and a half rounds. The over is even money at plus one hundred. Well, obviously, if I want to back myself up. I protect myself. I put a small, I guess I put a small play on the under, right? Because yeah. if Izzy loses, that would probably be the, the the way that you would think he would lose. So I guess you back yourself up with the under if the ghosts are still in the attic. You know, and well, they, the only thing I'd say to that is Izzy almost had him out of there. I think it was at the end of the second well, round. If the yeah. bell didn't ring when it did, 100%. Alex Perea is on roller well, skates. Either way, you win if you bet the unders. What I'm saying, yeah, yeah. of course. No, yeah, no, yeah. You, I get it. So, um, but I, uh, I guess back I'm backing my, you up. I say either guy can stop the yeah, other. I wouldn't be. I, I, I'd take yeah, the I under myself to back myself up. So I, I, I lay the wood on Izzy, and then I back myself up with a, you know. With a little protection on the under, I guess. Uh, I don't want to call it a save a bet, but, you know, a, a little bit of insurance, I guess. You got to pay for insurance, right? Insurance ain't free. For sure. Yeah. yeah that's for sure. <laughs> Should have been an insurance salesman. They, uh, they're, they're killing me. This insurance is, boy, they, they do good. They do good. You know, I, I want to – I always try to put every – we, somebody in the industry, good good guy. Actually, it was a couple guys, but this one person I'm just thinking of in the industry, in the boxing industry, has said, said he loves he loves you and he loves the show and 
and he's said that uh, people in the industry have said that they feel that we're having an impact to not just with the fans, which is the, our, our key, but an impact where people are listening in the industry. Like, you know, like even some of the comedy, like when it's a bad decision, instead of just, you know, swallowing their mic, um, they're actually saying something into the mic. Like, hey, that's 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 unjust. That's in, injustice. That's wrong. That's, you know, uh, and, and in the past, they hadn't been doing that. And uh, if we're having a little bit of that, if we're having a little bit of that sort of effect in the industry, that uh, I'm glad. That means, A, that means the people actually care about the job they're doing and care about what's going on and not wanting to, you know, ignore it and just get paid, like I say, how for their meals, only get their paycheck. They actually want to now say, all right, yeah, maybe I should say something. Maybe I should say something when it's really that bad. When it's really that bad. So if you are doing that, I, I don't know. I just applaud you, that's all. And I would say that's good. And what made me think about it is I wanted to mention there was a spot in the 10th round in a Franklin fight because I think fans want me to – I think they depend on both of us to kind of point everything out if it's possible. And there was a spot in the 10th round where the referee over in London, right, uh, over there, great crowd, home crowd, in the fight with Franklin and Joshua, where Joshua, just for that round, that's why I really saw it, but it could be dangerous. So that's why I'm pointing it out, where Joshua, and I think the ref saw it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he didn't. But you got to see it. You got to see it where Joshua put his hand behind the neck. I don't know if you saw it, Ken. And as he put his hand behind the neck of Franklin, he hit him with the uppercut. That's that, that's not allowed, first of all. But it, it's not allowed because it's dangerous. Because you're not giving the guy's head a chance to recoil, to give, to go back, to go to ride out the punch, to say take some of the concussive effect off of the punch. You're not allowing that to happen. You're, you're keeping the head right there, bang, and you hit him. And that that's dangerous, or could be dangerous. So that wasn't that wasn't called. It reminds me of when a when a when a UFC fighter punches a guy in the head when the guy's head is on the canvas and there's no room to roll or give yeah, with the scary. punch, or they get an but elbow the when they're to on get the in canvas. There, but you're 100 yeah. percent right. One thing those refs they know the urgency, they know the danger, they try to get in their fence. But these guys, you know, they're so geared up to, to, because they're so tough and resilient that even if he goes down, they're still hitting him because they might come back. I mean, that's their mentality. That's right. It's not that they're looking to really, you know, kill a guy. They, in their mind, it's, yeah, kill or be killed. That's their attitude, but not physically kill a guy. It's just that, they're geared in a different way that they know if they let these guys survive, he'll come back and he'll have him in that position. So, you know, the referee has to be right there in those fights, right there to jump and stop it. And I just wanted to say that and finish with that, that in the 10th round, that has to be called because I hate to say there's a precedent for it, but if you go back in the 50s, uh, it's a tragedy. But Emil Griffin, who was a great fighter. Emil Griffin, and I was friends with Emil. He used to train fighters when I trained him at Gleason's years and years ago. Um, he was a welterweight and middleweight champ. Uh, like I said, a great fighter, Emil Griffin. And he was fighting Kenny Kid Perret. And he, first of all, there was bad blood in the fight between the two of them. And he got him into a corner, and Perret was taking a beat. And he, there was a spot where he was holding his neck and he was, he hit him with some uppercuts and Perret was, was out. And the referee, I think it was Ruby Goldstein, who was a hell of a ref and a hell of a fighter, but I think it was him. I'm not sure. But anyway, the referee didn't catch it. 
he didn't catch it. Perret wound up dying. I'm not saying that's always going to be the case, but one is too many. You know, one is too many. And I'm not saying it was only because of that, but that definitely was, a, you know, one of the factors. He also had taken a beat in Perret. That's another thing why I'm on these commissions. I tear them apart. I tear them apart sometimes. They don't do their job. Because he had taken a beating from a big, big, strong fighter. I'm trying to remember this fight. He was a champion, actually. Uh, it was a bunch of brothers that fought. And they were from Utah. Look it up for me. He was a middleweight. He was a middleweight. What was his name? He was a middleweight champ, real strong guy. And he was too big for Perrette. And about four months earlier, he gave Perrette a terrible beat. Maybe it was three, four months earlier. Terrible beat. Um, what was the guy's name? And he had a bunch of brothers. But he, this one was a middleweight champ. Welterweight and middleweight, I think. He actually beat Sugar Ray Robinson. Robinson came back and knocked him out. And then uh, Gene Fulmer. It was Gene Fulmer. So he he fights Fulmer, Perrette, four months before the fight, the fight with with um, the fight with uh, I was just Emil talking, Griffin. Emil Griffin. He fights Fulmer four months earlier than the Griffin fight. Takes a beating and then comes back and fights this tough fight. And takes another beating and like I said, he winds up dying in a fight. That's why if fans are wondering when sometimes I'll say, like, Plant just took a lot of punches. Give him rest. Give him rest. I can't remember who else just took a lot of punches. It was somebody. Give him rest. When a guy, when a guy takes that kind of punches, it's the job of the commission. They don't do their job. Again, I don't care. I tell the truth. They don't do their job. They don't. And, and I don't know why they're getting paid. But they should do their job because that's part of their job. Make sure the guy don't a don't get back in the ring for a year, eight months, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever you figure it out medically, you know, with the right people to figure it out. And he doesn't get back in the gym because some of these trainers are knuckleheads. Some of them are great. Some of them are knuckleheads, and they they let them go. They think they know better. And they let him get back to sparring a month later. No. Make sure that they get the rest after that kind of beating. Anyway, back in those days, they weren't able to make sure that a guy like Kenny uh, Kid Perrette, Benny Kid, Benny Kid Perrette, would get the rest after that kind of beating. And I think that it it was, I think it had something to do with him getting hurt and then dying in the in the Griffin fight. But I just I want to explain to the fans that's why that's why I get into those places and I did on ESPN all those years, you know, because the danger is there. And I understand the danger. And the people, whether it's the commissioners, the trainers, they have to understand the danger too. It's part of their responsibility. It's part of why they have that job. I think uh, we did a pretty good job covering everything here. Yeah, that's it for a slow weekend. We got a lot of good content here. Uh, not all boxing related, but let's go. Big game tonight for UConn. By the time this comes out, we'll already know the results. Happy but birthday we to my daughter, on Monday. first of all. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to Nicole. Nicole. Congrats on the new baby. The and and lots to be happy about. Yeah, thank God. And let's go, let's go, Yukon. Let's go Huskies. Let's go Huskies. Let's go Huskies. Let's go. Yep. Let's hope tomorrow when you're watching this tomorrow and you're smiling, you're saying, Yeah, they won it. Yeah, Teddy, they won it. They yeah, Yukon won it last night. They won it. Yep. Good luck to Danny and the boys. Uh we'll certainly be watching from my house and um 
with that please if you're watching on youtube do us a favor just click subscribe down there like the video all that little stuff helps us i hate to sound like a youtuber like and subscribe but it is the truth at the end of the day that's how we get compensated and we're able to provide all the free content to everyone so if you like what you see do us a favor just leave a review at the minimum hit the subscribe button but um Thanks, Teddy. Good luck tonight. Have fun at Nicole's birthday. I know you got a busy day coming up. It's already been busy, so have fun. Happy birthday to Nicole. Thanks to Rob and everyone on the team for uh, all the professionalism, and we'll be back with you guys next week to break down all the UFC action. Have a great week, everyone. Boom. Boom.